Hi, everyone. Welcome. As we have many attendees with us, we kindly ask you to place yourself on mute. We will have a Q&A session at the end, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please type these into the chat box you should see at the bottom or side of your screen. Please note, this webinar will be recorded and made available at a later date. My name is Stephanie Franco, the moderator for today's webinar, and I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Nancy Nardone, Technical Product Specialist. With that being said, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Nancy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. I know there are a lot of options for webinars these days, so we appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us today. So to start off, we're going to talk about what the word calibration really means. It's important to understand the terminology that you're using so you can understand the process. Once we understand what, what calibration is, we'll talk about how a calibration is performed. It's important to have the correct tools and equipment to perform a calibration. And it's equally as important to know what to do with the data that's been collected during the process. The final part of the discussion will be when calibration should be performed. This is a question that gets asked frequently and there really just isn't a simple answer to it. So let's start with what calibration is. Calibrating your piston operated liquid handling instrument very simply means verifying the volume that the instrument is dispensing. And this is done by taking a series of measurements. To calibrate the instrument, the measurements obtained during the process are compared against the specifications of the instrument for accuracy and reproducibility. Once the measurements are compared against the specifications for the instrument, there are two main possible outcomes. One, the instrument meets specifications and can be put back into service, or two, it doesn't meet specifications and further steps need to be taken, either adjustment, maintenance, or retesting of the instrument. Of course, if the instrument is adjusted or maintenance is done, it should be retested again to verify that it does now meet specifications. I want to take a moment to discuss accuracy and reproducibility. Accuracy, sometimes referred to as the systematic error, is how close a measurement is to the expected value or volume in the case of a liquid handling instrument. Reproducibility, sometimes referred to as the random error, is how close each individual value is to each other. The terms precision and coefficient of variation are also used for this measurement. In this first example, the average of the measurements is close to the target or expected value, so the accuracy is good, and the measurements are all also very close together, so the reproducibility is also good. In this second example, the mean of the measurements will be close to the expected value, so the accuracy is good, but the measurements are not close together, resulting in poor reproducibility or a high CV. And then in this third example, while the measurements are very close together, so the reproducibility is good, the mean of the measurements is not close to the expected value, resulting in poor accuracy. It's also important to understand the relationship of accuracy and CV to volume when using an adjustable volume piston operated instrument. Sometimes, as in the example shown here, a manufacturer's specifications table will state a single accuracy and CV value for each instrument. The specifications shown here are for the nominal or 100% volume of the instrument. However, when the instrument is used at different volumes throughout its range, say at 50% or 10% of the nominal volume, the accuracy and CV percentages will be different. And the relationship is inversely proportional. As the volumes dispensed get smaller, the accuracy and CV percentage values are going to get larger. 
because of the design of a piston operated instrument the value of the value of the volume of inaccuracy or imprecision will stay the same across the volume range of the instrument but the denominator or the measured volume changes for example with this 25 mil dispense set, there's a volume of inaccuracy of 125 plus or minus 125 microliters. At the nominal volume of 25 mils, that's an accuracy of plus or minus 0.5%. But at 10% volume or 2.5 mils, that's an accuracy of plus or minus 5%. This is why it's always best practice to work in the upper range of a piston operated instrument if accuracy is important to your work. Great information so far, Nancy. It's time for our first polling question. You should see a poll question on the right side of your screen. We'd like to know who does the calibration for liquid handling instrumentation for your lab? Is it A, an off-site calibration facility, B, internal ca calibration group or lab, B, a vendor that comes on site, or D, you do your own calibration? We'll give everyone a few moments to answer. Okay, so seems to be a pretty good spread. Um, some people use off-site calibration facilities. A small amount have an intern, internal calibration group. Um, some people have a vendor that comes on site and a pretty good, a fair amount um, do their own calibrations. So obviously, you know, whoever performs the calibration for your liquid handling instruments is an individual de decision. Um, there are several factors that are going to go into the decision for, um, on who makes, who does your calibrations, um, including convenience, available resources, cost, and documentation requirements for your lab. Um, part of the decision process should include an understanding of the standards that relate to calibration of your liquid handling instruments. Industry standards that relate to calibration are set by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, which is a worldwide federation of national standards bodies. And there are two different ISO standards that relate to calibration, ISO 17025 and ISO 8655. The first standard, ISO 17025, is a general calibration standard. Any facility that performs equipment calibrations should be ISO 17025 certified. This means that it's met the standards recommended for a testing and calibration facility. An ISO 17025 certification means that the facility has demonstrated it has all of the components required for high quality, reliable testing and calibration in place. But an ISO 17025 certification is a broad certification for testing and calibration of equipment and devices. That's not to say when a facility is ISO 17025 certified, it isn't certified within a defined scope for specific equipment and devices, it is. But that scope of certification may be for vacuum gauges, not liquid handling instruments. So when a facility gets an ISO 17025 certification, with that certification, they get a cert certificate supplement. And that certificate supplement will list the equipment or devices that the facility has been certified to test and calibrate, such as vacuum gauges. Additionally, it will also note the range of instruments that the facility is certified for. In the case of liquid handling instruments, it will specify the volume ranges of instruments that the facility is certified to test. However, 17025 doesn't provide the standards for the specific equipment or devices required to conduct the testing or specify how the testing and calibration should be performed. ISO 8655 is the standard 
for piston-operated volumetric or liquid handling instruments, such as pipettes and bottle top dispensers, and it has multiple sections. Part one defines the terminology, requirements, and recommendations. Parts two through five provide the standards for each type of instrument. And part six describes the actual testing or calibration of those instruments. So parts two through five lay out the specifications for each of the instruments, while part six provides the actual details for how to determine if an instrument is meeting those specifications. So part six of ISO 8655 is titled Gravimetric Methods for the Determination of Measurement Error. Per ISO 8655, which sets the standards for piston-operated liquid handling instruments, testing and calibration of the instruments should be performed using the gravimetric method. For proper testing and calibration of liquid handling instruments then, it's not appropriate to use another liquid handling instrument. For example, it's not appropriate to test a dispenser with a graduated cylinder. And as we review what's required to properly perform gravimetric measurements for testing and calibration of liquid handling instruments, the reason for this will become clear. So to properly perform gravimetric measurements with your liquid handling instruments requires at a minimum the following equipment items. A thermometer that ideally has a measuring error of plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius. Water, which needs to be distilled or deionized. A balance that meets the recommended specifications for the instrument to be tested. And of course, a weighing vessel for the water that's going to be dispensed or pipetted. So temperature is an important parameter when you're doing the gravimetric method. It's necessary to ensure that everything used for the testing is placed in the testing area and allowed to equilibrate to room temperature for approximately one to two hours. Using the air displacement pipette as an example, differentials in temperature between the instrument and the liquid being pipetted will have an impact on the volume dispensed and of course, therefore, affecting the measurements that are being taken. Additionally, the temperature that the testing is conducted at must be recorded using a temperature, uh, excuse me, a thermometer that is ideally accurate to, again, plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius. The temperature needs to be recorded because of the effect of temperature on the density of water. So water is used for the gravimetric method of testing and calibrating all volumetric instruments. When a volumetric instrument is calibrated at the manufacturer or any time after, it's done using water. So an important note here that a quick check with whatever liquid is being dispensed at the time is not going to, be, is not going to provide valid information on your instrument. The type of water being used for the testing is also important. It must be distilled or deionized water. This is because they don't contain any minerals or contaminants that will affect the density of the water. The density of pure water is one gram per mil, which is integral to this whole process. Tap water will vary from one area to another, as will its density. So it's not going to be appropriate for, for use in calibration. And the density of water is going to be temperature dependent. The density of water at four degrees Celsius or 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit is one gram per mil. However, as temperature changes, so does the density of water, which is why it's important to record the temperature that the measurements are taken at. The balance used for the calibration should have a level of resolution appropriate for the volume of the instrument being tested. The lower the volume of the instrument, the higher the resolution of the balance that's required. 
This level of resolution is needed to be able to appropriately interpret the results. For example, the accuracy of a 100 mil dispenser is plus or minus 5%, which is plus or minus 500 microliters. The accuracy of a 2 mil dispenser is also plus or minus 5%, but that's plus or minus 10 microliters. So a balance with a higher resolution will be needed to test the lower volume instrument. In general, a higher volume instrument will require a balance with a four place resolution, while a lower volume instrument would require a balance with a five place resolution. And to refer back to the point on the previous screen about it not being appropriate to test one volumetric instrument with another volumetric instrument, it's because the volumetric instrument used is not going to be able to provide the level of measurement resolution that's needed for proper testing. So if you need to know how your instrument is performing, it's necessary to conduct a gravimetric test. And of course, it should also be noted here that whatever balance you're using for testing needs to be calibrated regularly as well. On the balance, you're going to need a receiving vessel for the dispensed or pipetted water. The bottom of the vessel should be covered with water. This is why this is because you don't want um, evaporation effects on your measurements. If testing small volume pipettes, such as an air displacement pipette with a 50 microliter volume or smaller, you can dispense the water into a capillary tube to reduce evaporation effects. And note that the balance should be teared or zeroed before each measurement. So you have your instrument ready to be tested, uh, balanced with the appropriate resolution, distilled or deionized water, and a thermometer to measure the temperature. All are equilibrated to room temperature. And to get the proper temperature reading, it's recommended that the thermometer be placed in a separate vessel containing the distilled or deionized water and the temperature recorded at the beginning of the procedure. In addition to the temperature, there is other basic procedural information that should be recorded. And this is shown in the test record sheet. The test record sheet also indicates the volumes that should be tested during the procedure. An adjustable volume instrument should be tested at its full or nominal volume, 50% of the volume and 10% of the volume. 20% um, can be used if that's the minimal vo minimum volume that's um, set by the manufacturer. And of course, fixed volume instruments naturally can only be tested at one volume because that is the volume that they work at. Testing an instrument at only one of these volumes, even if that is the volume that is generally used at, doesn't provide enough information about how the instrument is performing. Adjusting an instrument after testing at only one volume is sort of like trying to draw a straight line from one point. Additionally, it's recommended to take a minimum of five measurements at each volume tested, but 10 measurements is preferred. This provides the best, excuse me, best statistical analysis of the data. Statistical analysis isn't even possible with fewer than three data points. And the more data points you have, the more reliable your data will be. I don't know how many of you are online shoppers or if you bother to, you know, look at product or seller reviews, but if you do, do you get a better feeling with five reviews or 50 reviews? So for testing an instrument, 10 measurements at each volume, it's a good compromise between getting enough data for the analysis to be reliable without it being so many measurements that the process is cumbersome. It should be noted at this point, specifically for pipettes, that a manufacturer's specifications for accuracy and CV for the pipette are specifically with the manufacturer's pipette tip. ISO 8655 part two states that the pipette and tip are a system. If a pipette tip other than the manufacturer's tip is routinely used with the pipette, 
then that's the tip that should be used for the calibration process. Once the measurements are collected and recorded, what then? The first step is to convert the measurements to volume because the measurements are actually mass, right? The balance is being used to weigh the water that is being dispensed or pipetted. So the direct measurements obtained from the balance are in grams or milligrams, which are measures of mass, not volume. If those measurements are taken at four degrees Celsius, where the density of water is one gram per mil, then the conversion is an easy one to one. But if the measurements are taken at a different temperature, say at a normal room temperature of about 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius, the density is, of water isn't one gram per mil. However, the measurements in grams can easily be converted to volumes, mils, by applying the appropriate Z factor. This table here shows the Z factor values that can be used to convert the measurements based on the temperature of water. So knowing the temperature that the measurements were taken at and applying the correct Z factor allows the conversion of the measurements to volume. For example, if the measurements were taken at the temperature of 20 degrees C, they would be multiplied by the Z factor of 1.0029 to convert them to volumes. Note that it doesn't really matter if each individual value is transformed using the Z factor or the Z factor is applied to the mean values of measurements. The end result will be the same. Once the measurements have been, been converted to volume units, what then? More calculations and statistics words that most people are going to run from. What you see here are formulas that make most people's head hurt, heads hurt. And, but these are the formulas that need to be used to determine if the measurements taken determine that the instrument meets the expected accuracy and reproducibility specifications. Luckily, these days we have computers with spreadsheet software like Excel to help. It's simple enough to set up something that looks like the test record in an Excel spreadsheet with all of the formulas. So the measurements just have to be entered and the results are automatically calculated. It's just important to ensure that the correct adjustments for the Z factor and different nominal volumes are accounted for. Alternatively, you could take advantage of a software package like Bronze EasyCal, which is a free download and that will do all of the calculations for you. It also helps to track instruments. You simply input the same information that you'd put into a spreadsheet. Enter the measurements and the software will do all the calculations and even generate a report for you. So after the testing is complete and the data has been analyzed, what then? Well, if the instrument passes, you're all set, good to go. The instrument can be put back into service. But if the instrument fails, it's important to look at the individual data and results and where exactly it failed before taking any next steps. This is another reason why it's important to test at more than one volume. It helps to see what the results are at all of the volumes tested. A test result at a single volume simply doesn't provide enough information. Great, it's time for our next polling question. We'd like to know your thoughts on who determines the specifications for a liquid handling instrument. Is it A, the manufacturer, B, ISO, C, the end user, or D, all of the above? Again, we'll give you a little time to think about your answer. So we'll just give everyone a few more moments Great. I'm going to share the poll results. So we have a pretty good split on the responses here. And actually, the answer is all of the above on this one. Um, as we discussed previously, there are industry standards, 
for the specifications for piston operated liquid handling instruments. And those are provided in ISO 8655 parts two through five. So those are the specifications that any instrument should be expected to meet at a minimum. However, the manufacturer will also provide specifications for their own instruments. And those might be more stringent than the ISO specifications, but never less. But also, it's not uncommon for an end user to decide that less stringent specifications are accept, uh, yeah, excuse me, acceptable for their specific application. So depends on which specifications you're talking about. So before analyzing the data from your calibration, you need to determine which specifications the instrument is really being tested against. The manufacturer specifications, ISO 8655 standards, or the end user's own specifications. And especially if testing in a standard lab environment and not a controlled testing facility, it's acceptable and quite normal to expand the standard error limits up to double the ISO standards since the testing is not being performed in a controlled environment. So let's consider some different possible fail outcomes. In this first scenario, the liquid handling instrument has met the accuracy and CV specifications. Mind you, these are for the manufacturer's stated specifications at both the nominal and 50% volumes. But the accuracy specification at the 10% volume hasn't been met. It's close, but it didn't just didn't quite make the specification for this volume. So does this mean that there's a problem with the instrument? Should the instrument be adjusted or taken out of service? Not necessarily. First of all, let's consider that this data was probably generated in a general lab setting, not a calibration facility. So while the individual, individual performing the testing followed the testing instructions to the best of their ability, they were only capable of controlling certain factors. Some of the factors to be recorded on the test record that I didn't point out were environmental conditions, such as air pressure and relative humidity, conditions that can vary and are not tightly controlled in a standard lab. A quality calibration facility will control for these conditions. It's important to note that the specifications provided from a manufacturer are values obtained under controlled conditions. If testing is not occurring under these controlled conditions, it's reasonable to define your own error limits. And as noted previously, it's not uncommon to set the acceptable error limits to double the ISO standard limits. Second, let's revisit statistics and sample number. While 10 measurements at each volume may seem like a lot, it really isn't. And if all the other data is saying that the instrument is performing properly, then rather than adjusting an instrument or pulling it from service based on a single data point, retest it. If it just isn't possible to obtain satisfactory results after retesting a few times, then maybe the instrument needs to be sent to a calibration facility to get a good calibration on it. In this next scenario, the liquid in handling instrument has met the accuracy specifications at all the volumes, but not the CV specifications. And this could mean a few different things. Going back to our discussion of accuracy versus reproducibility, it's certainly possible that there is an issue with the instrument. If the CV specifications have not been met at any of the volumes tested, there's a good probability of an instrument error. The instrument sh should be removed from service and maintenance done, then the instrument retested. But if only one or two of the CVs have not been met, it's possible that the instrument is fine, but there was a technique error in the testing. So again, retest the instrument. Always a safe bet. In this third scenario, the liquid handling instrument has met the CV specifications but not the accuracy specifications. Again, going back to our discussion of accuracy versus reproducibility, the instrument is performing well in that each measurement is reproducible, but the volumes are not accurate. 
Looking closely at this data, it's apparent that the instrument is consistently off at each volume tested. So the instrument probably just requires an adjustment to return it to specifications. Once that adjustment has been made, another calibration should be performed to confirm that the instrument was adjusted properly and is now meeting specifications. If, however, a calibration report showed an instrument didn't meet accuracy specifications at only one volume tested, that would be another situation where a retest would be recommended, much like the first scenario where all the data except a single CV wasn't within specification. Remember, an instrument should never be adjusted based on the data from one volume or one data point. So these different examples of how an instrument can fail a calibration illustrate the steps that should be taken if an instrument doesn't meet specifications for accuracy or reproducibility after testing. The first step should always be to critically assess the results to determine what the issue really is and if the instrument really is out of specification. If the instrument is out of specification before adjusting the instrument, consider whether the instrument may require some basic maintenance or whether a retest is merited. If maintenance is done or an adjustment is made, a retest always needs to be performed to confirm that it is now meeting specifications. And finally, if the resources aren't available to perform a proper calibration, send the instrument to a calibration facility where it can get a proper calibration. Great, Nancy. This has all been very helpful information so far. It's time for our final polling question. How often does your lab have its liquid handling equipment calibrated? Select A for annual, B every six months, C every three months, D or some other time frame. I'll give you a few more seconds to answer. Okay. Well, again, we have a pretty good range. It looks like the majority of people at least. Um, calibrate their instruments annually. There are quite a few that do it every six months and even some that do it every three months. There are some that responded other. I don't know if that means you do it more frequently or less frequently, hopefully not less frequently. Um, so as I mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar, people, we often get asked, how often should I calibrate my instrument? And um, there isn't a single correct answer. Um, more frequent, less frequent. In bronze um, liquid handling instrument, the operating manuals for the liquid handling instruments, it states their recommendation that testing be performed every three to 12 months, which is a pretty good range. Um, so at a minimum, we recommend at least annually, um, at very least. But when should it be more frequent? That really depends on how the instrument is being used and the specific requirements of the user or the lab. If the instrument's being used in an academic or a teaching lab where documentation requirements are low, then annual testing is probably quite sufficient. However, if the instruments being used in a GLP lab with a really high level of documentation requirements, then testing every three months is warranted. Also, if the instrument is being used in such a way that might affect its performance, where it has a really high frequency of use or it's being used with really aggressive reagents, a more frequent calibration may also be warranted. In addition to a regular calibration schedule, if there's a specific occurrence that might affect the performance of an instrument, such as over aspirating into a pipette or dropping an instrument, that's another time that it's recommended to test the instrument outside of its normal calibration schedule just to confirm the performance of the instrument. 
Once a calibration is complete and a report is generated, it's important to note that this is really a snapshot of how the instrument is performing at that moment in time. If the instrument is handled and maintained properly, it should continue to perform as expected within specifications, no problem. However, we all know that unexpected, unexpected things happen. When sending an instrument to a calibration facility to have the testing done, it's possible to request, in addition to the final calibration certificate, an as-found report. The as-found report will detail the condition of the instrument when it arrived at the facility. Sometimes the as-found report will show that the instrument was not within specifications when it was received. And for some labs, this can be a real problem, um, especially with pipettes, because now all of the data that was produced with that instrument since the last calibration is questionable. Work, all of the work that was done with that instrument in that time period now has to be repeated at a significant cost in time and money. And with air displacement pipettes, over 80% of the time, the issues that are found are due to leaks in the pipette. And these leaks don't have to be large enough to result in dripping from the tip to affect accuracy of the pipette. So a useful tool that can be used with pipettes between scheduled calibrations is the Brond Pipette Leak Testing Unit, or PLT. As the name implies, the PLT tests for leaks in a pipette. Now the PLT is not a substitute for gravimetric testing. It's simply a tool to be used between calibrations for quick checks. It can be used to test the pipette alone and can determine if there's a general leak or if a dirty or defective piston is causing a leak. It can also be used to check the fit of a tip to the pipette, check the whole system to ensure that the tip being used is providing a good seal with the pipette. And using the PLT Connect software with the system allows you to track individual pipettes as well as daily and weekly self-tests of the PLT. Um, it's a nice tool to have just to keep track of that your pipettes are working well in between calibrations. Another tool for quick check of liquid handling instruments is the three mark flasks. These flasks from bronze can be used as a quick check, as I said, with bottle top dispensers. They're a class A measuring flask with a mark in the middle at the nominal volume and upper and lower marks, which indicate the error limits. So to do a quick check with your dispenser, you simply dispense the nominal volume of distilled or deionized water into the flask. The meniscus should fall within the upper and lower marks. Of course, again, the instrument shouldn't be adjusted after checking with a three mark flask. If the instrument were found to be out of specification after doing a couple of checks with this, a full gravimetric check should be done with your instrument. So to review, calibration simply means verifying the volume an instrument is dispensing or pipetting by taking a series of measurements. The standards for piston-operated liquid handling instruments are described in ISO 8655 and Section 6 of ISO 8655, excuse me, describes the gravimetric method for calibration. To properly perform the gravimetric method requires at a minimum a thermometer to record the temperature, distilled or deionized water, a balance with the appropriate resolution, and a weighing vessel. And instruments should be calibrated on at least an annual basis, but for some labs, a more frequent calibration schedule is required. And if there's a specific reason to suspect that an instrument may be out of spe specification due to an event such as over-aspiration or dropping the instrument, of course, it should be checked immediately. 
and there are some helpful tools that can be used for a quick check of your instrument, such as the PLT or three mark flask, but these tools are not substitutes for a gravimetric test. And finally, if it is not possible to perform a proper gravimetric test in house because the appropriate equipment isn't available or conditions just don't allow for it, or if a certified calibration certificate is required for documentation or re record keeping purposes, the instrument should be sent to a certified calibration facility on at least an annual basis for calibration. So I hope you found at least some of this information helpful. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If you have any questions that didn't get answered here today during the Q&A session that will follow or simply would like some more information, please email us at support at brandtech.com. And as a reminder, this webinar is being, re be excuse me, is being recorded and we will be making it available at a later date. Thank you. Well, we'll now move to the Q&A session. Great, Nancy. I think that was a wonderful presentation. Um, we have had several questions come in, so we'll go through these. And again, if your question is not answered, we will make sure to follow up with you after the broadcast. First question is, is it advisable to perform the calibration with pipette tips used in the lab space? If we are using pipette tips, which are from a different vendor, then how do we know if it's the instrument versus the tip? Wow, that will, that's a great question. So if you are using tips, third-party tips, um, is how we refer to them. If you're using third-party tips on a regular basis, Yes, I recommend that you do the calibration first with the third party tips. If the instrument um, fails calibration with those third party tips, then I would recommend testing the instrument with the manufacturer tips um, to determine whether that it's the instrument or the tips. Um, that's always actually our first question when people tell us they're having an, um, a problem with calibration is what tips you are using. Um, so yes, if you're having an issue with calibration and you're not using the manufacturer's tip, it's always a good, good um, idea to go back and, and double check with the manufacturer's tips and confirm that the pipette is performing properly with the manufacturer's tips. And then once you make that confirmation, then you can go and do the confirmation, do the calibration, excuse me, with the third party tips. And sometimes depending upon what the third party tip is, if the, the shape is different, you may need to make an adjustment on the instrument based on that calibration, but always confirm with the manufacturer's tips first that the instrument is operating properly. Okay, great. Um, another question that has come in, Nancy, is are there advantages or disadvantages to using digital or analog thermometers when doing the calibration testing? Um, I don't think there's any advantage or disadvantage to digital versus analog. I think the accuracy um is really the the question as long as it's and you're confident in the accuracy of your thermometer um ideally again you want it to be accurate to plus or minus 0.2 degrees celsius that's really the parameter that you're looking for okay um another question what is the recommended frequency for use of the class a three-line flask for spot checking bottle top dispensers? Oh, that sort of falls under the category of how often should I calibrate my um, instrument? There really isn't a um, standard recommended frequency. It depends upon um, how the instrument is being used and the requirements of the, the user. It, 
really the application, um, what, what your needs are for your application. Okay, another question. Um, our calibration group offers several different levels of reports. Which one do I want? Um, that's a good question as well. And again, um, that is an end user um, requirement. So yes, calibration facilities will offer different levels of reports. Um, so you can get a, a very basic report that will um, just provide a final calibration with five measurements, or you can um, obtain a very high level report that will provide the as found and a final calibration with 10 measurements at each of the vol volumes shown, um, and then different um, variations in between. And which level of report you request really depends upon the, the needs for documentation in your own lab. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Is organic liquid measurement by a pipetter, not calibration, as accurate as measurement for water? Can you say that again, please? Is organic liquid measurement by a pipetter as accurate as measurement using water? I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that. Okay. Um, um, I, I guess I'll just go back to water. I mean, the, the standard per ISO 8655 for calibrating a liquid instrument is gravimetric me is the gravimetric method using water and the water should be distilled or deionized water okay one more question oh it disappeared when i received my burette there is a calibration certificate why isn't the actual gravimetric result sent with it Um, if you're talking about a BROND instrument, BROND provides certificates of performance. Um, they don't provide full calibration certificates. That's um, simply their policy. Um, they have been, the instruments are calibrated. Um, they just provide um, a certificate of performance, which gives mean provides mean data. Um. Okay, excellent. I think that's all of the questions that we have today. We would like to thank everyone for attending. And again, if you have a question that was not answered during the Q and A or presentation, please contact us at support at brandtech.com. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.